I'm Corey Astle. And I'm Kyle Simon. Welcome to Conservative Minds, a podcast dedicated to examining conservative intellectual history to determine the core values of American conservatism. What did it mean to call yourself a conservative? What did it mean in prior times and how did we get where we are today? We explore these questions and more by turning to conservative political thinkers from the past and present. Each episode, we select readings and conduct a discussion to share with you our investigation. If you want to join the discussion, like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at ConsMinds at C-O-N-S-M-I-N-D-S. For episode 38, we read The Once and Future Worker by Oren Cass from 2018. Oren Cass earned a bachelor's degree in political economy from Williams College and a JD from Harvard Law School. He worked as a management consultant for Bain and Company's Boston and New Delhi offices and became domestic policy director for Mitt Romney's 2012 presidential campaign. He's currently a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute and has written for various publications. His first book, Once in Future Worker, which we'll read today, was published in 2018. Warren Cass begins his book by laying out what he describes as the current situation in America. Basically, the median workers' wages have barely budged. We've heard this before. Despite doubling per pupil spending and attempting countless education reforms, he says, test scores look no better than they did 40 years ago. And so this book explains where we went off track and how we might turn around, he says. And his basic argument is that work matters. His main argument is a labor market in which workers can support strong families and communities is the central determinant of long-term prosperity and should be the focus of public policy. Family and community provide the social structures necessary to a thriving society and a growing economy. And I want to highlight real quickly, this is sort of the rightward populism. It's not, uh, those folks on the right who are, who are populist, they're, they're not overly obsessed with income inequality, you know, who, who makes more relative to another. But instead, they're focused on strong families, on strong communities, on stable work, because he says, without stable families and without stable communities and families, econo- economic op- opportunity actually vanishes. And that's kind of a core tenet of conservatism because the focus is not so much on who makes more than another person, but rather economic opportunity comes when families are strong, when communities are strong. Yeah, I, I think that's, that, that's something we see in these as, as the presidential campaign gets going. They're all talking about income inequality among the the hard left and it's just we're talking past each other i think what we're more concerned about and we'll see kind of in this book and in some of the other books we read is is the sort of um the inequality of of uh, of place maybe mm-hmm. you know in, in the way that if jobs are disappearing in one place and reappearing in another in a different field in a different state you know that looks the same on the books, you know, when you say how many jobs are there in America, how much money are people making? And he gets into GDP, which we'll talk to talk mm-hmm. about in a few minutes. But I think that is something that, that your more Berkey and conservatives are concerned about is the, the fact that everything's draining away from these established communities and what's left, like you were saying is no jobs and money doesn't, we work for money, right? I mean, that's why mm-hmm. we work, but, the, but, But just getting the money without the work isn't the same thing. I think that's kind of what we're waking up to. This book is really just sort of a a hard look at all of the failures of the the policies of the past 40, 50 years that that tried to replace work in in various communities or tried to reshape people for new jobs and, and failed at it. Definitely. And so he says neither party is helping. They both have kind of failed. The Republicans, he says, are guilty of benign neglect because... Republicans put far too much faith in the market, he says, and what we need is some interventions, which we'll go through. The Democrats, for their part, they sound committed to workers, but their agenda actually centers on the interests of labor unions, environmentalists, and identity groups, he says, which, you know, I couldn't agree with more. Mm -hmm. Payroll taxes, workplace rules, environmental regulation has raised the cost of employing lower wage workers. Two main factors that he'll point to that we were a little bit familiar with. Number one is immigration. Immigration has increased the supply of low wage workers on the one hand, and then free trade has increased the supply by outsourcing. This is a conversation we've had before too. So he says trade efficiency gains and immigration have led to growth in GDP like you just raised, but we gave up something. He says 
labor markets can no longer allow no longer allow families and communities to support themselves and the alternative that he's going to argue for is to make trade-offs that instead place the renewal of work and family at the center of public policy rather than making money or consumption and that's the thesis of the book that and that yeah i think that's uh, to start with he he um he gets into the the whole idea of gross domestic product the gdp that we hear so much about that we hear about is the economy growing uh you know is we hear about is this policy going to contribute to gdp is it going to take away from it and what he says this is kind of a measure that doesn't really even capture all of economic life let alone all of productive life mm-hmm. there's you know it was it was invented as as during the second world war as sort of a crude measure of how much can we get done how much can we build how much can we throw into the fight against you know the, the nazis and the japanese and that, you know that's an important thing to measure when you're trying to organize an economy for war but and since then even though it's been tweaked in different ways it doesn't really capture everything that gets done and i one of the examples uh, i'm trying to find it in my notes here but as i remember it he said if if two women each stay home and raise their children gdp considers that a, a zero right they're yeah. not in a workplace <laughs> they're not doing anything yeah, yeah. but if each of them hires the other one to take care of their kids you know they just swap households all of a sudden that's two jobs <laughs> and that's yeah. And that's and even if they're paying each other the same amount, and it's a it's a complete wash economically. It's yeah, just yeah. a weird idea, but that makes GDP better, and that kind of shows the, the, the. It's a good example of how there's stuff getting done, and there's stuff about work that's not measured, just in the in the econo- in the economist numbers. Mm-hmm. This is a Democrat's uh, argument also uh, against uh, Republicans and you know libertarian conservatives that. He says, you know, to your point, overall GDP does not remedy ongoing social collapse, reverse workforce abandonment, or lessen government independence. And I think he, he does have a point that, you know, for someone like me who consider myself a Wall Street Journal Republican, I mean, it's kind of like may, maybe economic growth doesn't solve all the problems. And that that's the strong, I think that's the strong argument that he's making with regard to GDP because... He says people's ability to produce matters much more than how much they consume. <laughs> Cheap goods and plentiful transfer payments ensured that nearly all Americans could af- can afford cable television and air conditioning, but not that they can build fulfilling lives around productive work, strong families, and healthy communities. And this really struck me f- from the standpoint of you know an argument, even a conversation I was just recently having with my dad that you know there's a kind of a, f- a frustration I've had that those on the left just, you know, argue that everybody's falling behind in the economy and you're kind of like, yeah, there are people who who do better than others. That's true. But, you know, just look at a little bit of history, you know, how far people come. I mean, you know, being, we, we don't want people living in poverty, but again, poverty today is much different than it was in 1940 or 1950 mm-hmm. or 1960. I mean, you have a cell phone, you have cable TV, you have air conditioning, you have a place to live. But the, the you know the argument that Cass is making here is that okay great you have all these cheap goods you know you we have Walmart which is great I shopped at Walmart this weekend like ten times when I was <laughs> <laughs> but um, and, and you can get some great deals and and it's easier to live on much less and and to live much more comfortably but that's not what leads to a fulfilling life instead what leads to a fulfilling life is productive work and strong families and healthy communities and. And, uh, and I think that's an argument we've seen since you know, the beginning of our podcast with, you know, Richard Weaver and, and, you know, on and on down the line. It's kind of an, an answer, although people don't realize it to the automation question too, is that, you know, we have, we have increasing standards, which means that even as basic goods get automated in their production, it doesn't mean that people are just going to say, all right, well, I've got all the stuff I needed in 1960 i'm not going to buy anymore yeah, now, <laughs> now they want that cable tv they want that air conditioning they want all the yeah. things that you know our parents didn't grow up with or even we didn't grow up with some mm-hmm. of it you know so i mean that that does change and i guess it's a success of the, the success part of the the great society programs is yeah poverty is way better today than it was 50 years ago you know I mean, people are still poor but it's not that edge of starvation poor that yeah it's you relative, had. i mean poor. You know, so, I mean, it's still, you can get these benefits. The failure is you just keep getting the benefits. You never get out. 
you yeah. never stop being yeah. poor. Yeah. You know, they, the government's keeping you alive, but they're not giving you that leg up that it was always sold as, you know, yeah. so this yeah. was just the temporary, you know, and people are down their luck, but this will, this will give them a, a solid basis to, to climb out of there and, you know, do for themselves. And that it happens, like, you know, to some people, but for the most part, it doesn't happen. And that, and meanwhile, the lifestyle of getting money for not working, especially, I mean, when they increase the benefits, that just makes it easier not to work, you know, and, and it, it makes it rational not to work at times, you know, yeah. you know in the economic sense. Well, and he has it, a great it, line about uh, universal basic income where he says, we have reached a point where the rich think paying everyone else to go away represents compassionate thinking. <laughs> I underline that one too. That's, that's perfect. I, I just thought that that just jumped out and that's going to be my, my retort from here on out. Cause that's you, you and I have said this in, in not so eloquent terms that universal basic income is just another way of saying like, Hey, we're going to, we're going to pay you this bribe to go away. And so that we can go ahead and like <laughs> keep having our, really interesting career and fulfilling. You know? <laughs> yeah. And, and what he's saying is like more money is not going to create more happiness because basically people already have, you know, plentiful stuff. They've got, they've got the cheap goods. Okay, great. You know, what we need is, is a, a dad who stays in the home. You know, what we need is kids who, who are, you know, taught when they're younger, you know, who have, what we need is, you know, parents who have good, stable jobs where they can, they can count on, um, you know, stability and just giving people money. Yeah. That's going to, that's going to pay their bills, but it's really no different than any other government uh, benefits that, you know, address the immediate material needs, but give no leg up, like you said. And, and he calls it, he says the effect of all this is actually much more corrosive than the government benefits. So, I, yeah, I, I think that's right. I mean, I, I think, I don't know, if you've ever been unemployed, it it changes the way you look at things right away. Yeah. You know, I mean, I when I got laid off in 08, I mean, you, you get used to idleness. And even though I wanted to get back out there and eventually did, you know, after a couple of months, I don't know, it, it degrades the brain, you know, yeah, and, yeah. you know, it, it really makes you feel like, well, you know, I mean. Another day, day goes by so fast, you know, you can get, you know, you don't have to do anything. We're not starving. We still got savings, you know, it, it, it makes it easy to be lazy. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And if, you know, the more benefits there are, make it, it, it changes that mindset. I mean, he talks about in this book about some of the, just the benefits of work is it makes for an ordered existence. It makes you goal oriented. It makes you get out of bed every morning and, and yeah, yeah. do something and make something and, you know. You, when you have a job, you're doing something that somebody values enough to give you money to do it. That's, that's a good feeling, you know, I and mean, even, even if the money you were making is the same as you could make in 20 different federal benefit schemes put together, mm -hmm. you know, there's something to it. There's a real, a sense of, uh, accomplishment and contribution to the community. And that, that's always what makes me mad about the Andrew Yangs and the the universal basic income ideas is that they, they don't think we have anything to contribute to the community. At least some of yeah, us. Yeah. They yeah. think we're, you know, worthless, uh, sponges that are just soaking up benefits and our jobs are going to be done by robots. So here's a thousand bucks a month. Go stay home and play video games and, you know, do what you're going to do. Yeah. I mean, they have, they have this Alice in Wonderland delusion that, that people are all of a sudden going to, Oh now now that I don't have to work, I can be, you know, write that great American novel and I can paint and become the next, uh, you know, Leonardo da Vinci, which I just, it's just brain dead. I mean, yeah, you, you're going to have a few people do that out of hundreds of millions. You know? Yeah. And then the rest of them are just going to be miserable. You know? Yeah. They're not going to get out of their pajamas until like four o'clock in the afternoon and, uh, and play video games. I mean, I just, I, I'm confident that at least half of men would behave that way, you know, just knowing, being a yeah. man myself and knowing people. And and the other half would be selling weed. <laughs> yeah. To, to, to the, the lady who are sitting home. <laughs> <laughs> That's where the money's going to go. It's going to be <laughs> drugs, alcohol, video games, movies, you know. It's, it's because there are a lot of people that if they don't need to work, if they're told by our the powers that be, you don't need to work, don't worry about it, they won't. And, you know, after, it's already been a few generations where men's income hasn't been as important to the family as it had been throughout human history. 
So you know, we've already got a base of, of idleness to build on. Yeah. That's what Cass is getting at. You know, can we can we rebuild this idea of work have, having meaning? Definitely. And so here's his recipe for real prosperity. He says, emphasize the ability to produce rather than the ability to consume. Attend not only to economic outcomes, but also to social foundations. Now, this goes back to our reading with Deneen, you know, why, why liberalism failed. You know, it's not just a focus on getting more, 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 but instead that market tendency to become more and more efficient actually degrades the, the social foundations. He says, more important than economics to life satisfaction is accomplishments like fulfilling traditional obligations, building strong personal relationships, succeeding at work, supporting a family, and raising children capable of doing all these things themselves. I like that he said traditional obligations because yeah. there is there is real fulfillment in for so taking care of kids or taking out the garbage or getting the lawn mowed. You know, mm-hmm. you know, su- succeeding at work doesn't mean that. You know that I get my boss's job so much as like I did a, a good day's work and I feel good about it. You know, I for me I got you know exercise my mind, but other people would rather work with their hands or whatever. But you, you get to do something, produce something, and then you know raising kids that I think is actually a an under appreciated you know value in our society is uh, the folks that are these these elites who live on the coast who, who run our, you know, media and, and Hollywood establishments, you know, frankly, most of the people that I work with, like either they don't have kids or, you know, they have, you know, they get married and have kids very late in life. And so there's not an appreciation for how cool that really is and how fulfilling and, you know, they're a pain in the butt. Don't get me wrong, but they're also, you know, your greatest fulfillment comes from like teaching the kid to make that crossover dribble or something like that. <laughs> Absolutely. This is where life fulfillment comes. Yeah. I mean, and some of the other things you're talking about too, just like the, the work you do on your own home is, is also fulfilling, even though it doesn't bring you that paycheck, you know? Yeah. You, you drive around your neighborhood and we both live in the suburbs. So, you know, you, you see the one with the high grass and you're like, what's going on there? Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, this yeah. is, this is a heresy <laughs> in the suburbs. So, you know, it is satisfying to keep your place looking nice fix things that are broken, you know, because it gives your family a good home and it also gives you that respectability the same way a job does, you know, the same way you can hold your head high in the community and say, I'm, I'm making, you know, I'm not taking, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm mm-hmm. contributing. I'm, I'm helping keep this family afloat and helping, you know, do my part to keep this community afloat. So it, yeah, there's, yeah. I, I think it's just a huge difference that we, when we get our heads in the numbers too much, we lose sight of those, those intangibles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. He may, he has this line that goes back to something you said too. life satisfaction drops 10 times more from unemployment than from a substantial loss of income. And, uh, you know, I know that too. I had having worked, uh, worked in the Senate, you know, like the Senator retires or loses his, his race, which has happened to me. Both of those have happened to me. It means I lose my job. And, and you know, we had two months without pay with, uh, with three kids and man, it's terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My life satisfaction dropped. I promise you that. Yeah. And I mean, I, I think that, I think that affects a lot of people even afterwards. I mean, you talk about our, our grandparents in the depression, you know, how they were always, always hustling, you know, uh, always trying to make sure that they had security and safety. And I felt that way after the recession too, you know, it's like none of them freelancing. It feels like if a day I don't pitch a story or, or, or get some sort of assignment. It's uh, like, well, I don't know. I'm not doing enough around here. You know, I got to, yeah, yeah. and that's, I think a better mindset than the, the one that's so it's so easy to slip into without, you know, without that need for work. So what are the policy prescriptions? Well, again, he says meaningful work should be the focus of everything. He says work is meaningful because of what it means to the person performing it what it allows him to provide to his family, what role it established for him, establishes for him in his community. Where fewer men work, fewer marriages form. And when parents lose their jobs, ki- kids tend to do worse in school, graduate at lower rates, and have less success as adults. This, see, this is a variable that also correlates. Folks on the left will say, well, kids are not doing well in school because the, parents are, because the income is low. And we're like, yeah, what, what, what they want is a good, stable job you know, that, that has trickle down effects on the kids, but he says policies when he wants a social uh, 
policy prescriptions. He says we should be skeptical of social engineering. He says we need to support market interventions to keep struggling communities alive or career paths open. Policies that help people stay in their local communities, strong families and communities launch, launch people into the rest of the world. So he, he's, he's going to, we'll get into this here now, but he's going to argue that what we need is actually some market intervention. So he's, he's coming from the right, but it's, it's different than the libertarian, it's different than the libertarian right, which would say, you know, markets at all costs, you know, market is always the answer. So he's going to say, let's make smart interventions in the market with the goal of not changing income ratios, but instead with the goal to help build strong communities. Yeah, he's definitely pro-market. Um, it's not, yeah, he's no socialist for sure. Um, the guy who worked for Bain Capital and Mitt Romney is definitely not a socialist. But yeah. he, uh, I think he understands something that a lot of people feel, although it's, not, it's hard to articulate, is that the market for labor is different than the market for goods. Mm -hmm. We make goods to be sold. You know, that's why you make them. You know, that's why a factory opens. That's, that's why a workshop opens, you know, it's because somebody has an idea and says, I can, I can sell this thing to people. They'll pay more than it costs me to make it. And I will make a living on that. And that's good. That's how goods work. That's always how they work. That's not really how we think of our labor though. You know, I mean, there's, there's so many intangible effects tied up in our idea of our work and our labor. And so you get these market inefficiencies that, that he, he points out is, you know, people say, well, my labor's worth 10 bucks an hour. And the boss says it's worth seven fifty, and that's only because I have to pay you seven fifty because that's minimum wage in the state. And then you get this disconnect, and you know, if that were goods, it works itself out easier because people say, "Well, look, I got to buy it." And they're at the end. But now, because we have social welfare programs that can you know, keep you afloat, and we have minimum wages that distort things, and we have all these different things going into fixing the labor market it really just muddies the waters and we have a we have a market that that doesn't work the way other markets work i, I think mm -hmm. i think that's pretty accurate i mean i i think labor is different than goods although a lot of the forces that act on it are similar yeah and so part of his policy prescriptions is uh have a focus on getting kids prepared for mm -hmm. work um, and work that's available and he has a really biting critique of, you know, our education um, system right now, because right now, high schools, junior highs and high, uh, middle schools, high schools are focused on moving kids into college. But he'll say college for all doesn't work. College completion actually is implausible for most Americans. Only about one fifth, one fifth, 20 percent will successfully navigate high school to college to career. So he, he goes into this in depth and, you know, there's, there's plenty of data out there. Charles Murray was on this as well to, to basically show that, you know, at most a third of Americans have degrees. So you're really talking about really a quarter and he'll say, and Cass is saying 20% that's going to actually go from college to career. But our schools right now, our high schools are geared really to help kids prepare to take, you know, SATs so that they can go to college. But only one in four or at most one in three are going to go instead like he gets he gets very detailed about uh how how best to you know track high school students and move them into careers that actually they will enjoy and that they that actually fit you know their their abilities and their interests he says separate high school students into education programs that seek different outcomes he says, and, and what, he's, what he's really getting at is more occupational training. Occupational training could give a 20-year-old serious work experience, a marketable skill, and $30,000 in, in a savings account. And what he means is, you know, in high school, instead of studying the uh, calculus, which, you know, most kids are just not going to do, instead provide more vocational training, on-the-job training. I mean, frankly... Outside of like preparing for college, a lot of high school is a waste of time. I really, I, I thought mm -hmm. so even as a high school student. Yep. I mean, you take, uh, you know, I had, you know, I had, I had basketball gym and I had weightlifting and I had TAs <laughs> for two different classes. You know, it's just okay. Well, what are we even learning? You know, what's what, what is the point? And 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 instead of you know having this focus on the few kids, he says the 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 few with a golden ticket, he says who are actually going to go to college. Let's just sh completely shift our focus. Let's get kids into career, into careers early. 
Uh, you know, you can, you can make here in Northern Virginia, you can make it, you know, starting salary of 50 or $60,000 as an electrician, but you have to, you know, kind of move through an apprenticeship program. So why don't we start that in high school? Why don't we give kids those good options where they can actually start working for a company part-time getting school credit and making a little bit of money? Mm -hmm. That's what he means by, you know, having money in a savings account by the time you're 20 years old, because you're kind of, you're kind of working towards it, you know, as a plumber or a machinist or, you know, any of these, what I, what I would call sort of mid mid level, you know, careers. Why not start that in high school and get people going? And he says, the reason why we don't, the obstacle he says is philosophical, not practical. That is we need to relinquish some cherished egalitarian ideals that do more harm than good. The philosophical obstacle is basically like, and and I understand this. I mean, we don't like the thought of saying, well, this kid, he's just not going to make it in college. And, you know, so let's, let's push him into some vocation. But what Cass is saying is like, look, that kid is not going to college. So let's help him find something he's really going to enjoy and something that's going to be stable and something that's going to, you know, be a career for the rest of his life. Yeah. Cause now we're, now we push him into college and he doesn't finish and he racks up five or six years of debt. And yeah. you know, yeah. the debt is still good, whether you get the degree or not, they're going to make you pay it. Yeah. So now you've got a guy who's just wasted years of his life. Maybe he's had some, you know, good times went to some cool parties, but at the cost of uh, a student loan, that's going to saddle you with, you know, payments every month. And you're no better trained for any job when you yeah. don't finish college. Nobody, nobody wants to look at it, you know, on the resume. Well, I, I did several years at such and such university. Did you finish? No. Okay. So that's the same as a high school degree yeah. as far as the yeah. employer is concerned. Cass says the goal should be to ensure that every person, no matter her starting circumstances, can find a vocation that allows her to support a family, live in a community where she can build a good life, and then give to her children even greater opportunity than she had herself. That's a great goal. And it doesn't yeah. it doesn't have to include college. Yeah. And then he gets into the, the dreaded word of tracking, which, as you mentioned, it's got this, you know, people. Yeah. Nobody in America wants to admit that his kid's not going to be the billionaire you know, are not going to be the PhD, but most of us aren't. Yeah. And, you know, Europe understands this, you know, we're the only country that has this sort of mono tracking system that sh- shunts almost everybody on the academic track in high school. Mm-hmm. Like uh, he, he mentioned at one point that, that OECD comparisons between Europe and us, and it's like, they don't even compare them because our educational system is so different in that way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the Germans, the Swiss, the French are all, understanding that it's you know it's better for everybody to train a kid in something you might actually be able to do than to this sort of like yeah go to go to college what should i major in i, I don't know just just <laughs> do it just get communications i don't know like you're supposed to get a degree that's what we all do right and i think we can understand how we got on got onto this track right like mm-hmm. the, yeah. the idea that we want all kids like this is america you have the big right. american dream you should go to college and that's how you're going to make more money but he says experience has shown that most high school seniors are unprepared to succeed in a college environment and the K through 12 system has shown limited capacity to change this. There has been essentially no change in high school graduation graduation rates after 40 years of reform and investment. As far as we can tell, school quality may not be the big factor in academic achievement that many people believe it is. Expenditures this is a very conservative <laughs> factoid to put out there. Expenditures and related school input inputs have very weak associations, not only with test scores, but also high school graduation rates and college entry. <laughs> In other words, we have not found the school-based tools that will consistently reshape trajectories, including early childhood interventions or anti-poverty programs. We're coming up with new things like early childhood that's shown mm-hmm. that it doesn't work. Anti-poverty programs 40 years later, you know, they don't work. And he, the point he's really trying to make here is not that we haven't found the silver bullet. It's that we're not going to find the silver bullet. <laughs> yeah, you can't just you throw know? money at it. And, and, yeah. and, well, no, he, he mentions in that same section. That per pupil spending has doubled since the seventies in, yeah, in, re- yeah. in real dollars and, uh, scores for 17 year olds in both reading and math have remained flat. Wow. That's, that's shocking. I mean, that's all this. We, we constantly hear about per pupil spending in this, in different school districts and, you know, teacher to student ratios, mm-hmm. none of it's doing a thing. Um, 
That's just so astounding. And uh, I think what conclusion Orrin Cass is coming to is he's not coming to the conclusion of, oh, we just haven't found, you know, the right dial to turn or the right level lever. Instead, he's like, we're not going to find it because that's just how humans are set up. So let's focus on what we actually, what, what the, what the world is really like. You know, this is a very conservative argument. Like let's take the world Mm -hmm. as it is instead of trying to pretend like we can remake, you know, humanity, human nature. Yeah. I mean, this, this sort of thing shows it's the same as the anti-poverty spending is that, you know, you, you do it up to a point and it helps, you know, I mean, when, you know, 200 years ago, a lot of people were illiterate. A lot of people didn't have more than a couple of years of schooling. If they had any, you know, you're talking about the one room schoolhouse, you know, out in the country, not, you know, when they were just sitting and memorizing from a certain book and that was it, you know, uh, so we've gotten better than that. And that made a difference. You know, now everybody, everybody can go for 12 years of school for free. And that really, that did help, but we got there decades ago. You yeah. Know, we've, right. we've had, we've had a basic public education since, I mean, for a hundred years. So the fact that test scores haven't moved is I think maybe the test scores are just reflecting. That's how smart people are. That's mm-hmm. it. Like you, you can throw more stuff at them, but that's, we have reached the limits of uh, 17 year olds educational achievement. Yeah. That's, and that's, and that's, that's an accomplishment. You know, that's normally, you know, in the business, when you, when you reach your goal, you know, you check it off and you, you tell your shareholders like, look, we did it. We're going to move on to something else, but the government never moves on to something else. Yeah, they just yeah. pay more. Well, we can do better. Let's double it, you know, and it doesn't move. He, so I think, uh, yeah, we've we've hit the end. We got it. You so, know, we, so the critics of this podcast are probably listening, saying, "Well, it's easy for you two to say because you guys did go to college, you went to law school, and you know your kids are probably going to do the same thing." So this is just you saying that you know you want to hoard all the you know, all the spoils of the, of the economy. And, and Hey, look, I, I'm going to, I'm going to recognize that there, that's a, that's a valid critique. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've given this a lot of thought. I really have. Cause what if, what if one of my kids, you know, either wasn't making it in college or just wasn't interested in going. I think I personally would be okay with that as long as they actually went into something else. You know, if, if yeah. you know my son went in to, to be a plumber, Hey, look, there are plumbers in Northern Virginia that make $200,000 a year. So it's not like, you know, you can't be successful, like, you know, doing something other than, you know, getting a gender studies degree from, you know, from a <laughs> university. So, you know, so I, I, I guess, you know, this is all conjecture and hearsay, but, you know, I think, I think I would be all right with it as long as, you know, they actually did something that was meaningful to them where they were working hard and they were still hustling. I mean, that to me is the most, these are the most important factors to, to getting along and being successful actually. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my, my relatives in the trades do pretty well and, and without having the time or expense of college degrees, you know, to put out there first. I remember when I was applying to colleges at one point, my mom just said, are you sure you want to go? And I said, yeah, you know, cause like you have to, right. And it, you know, it turned out well for me. Like you said, I mean, you know, it, we're, we're having this podcast from the perspective of guys with graduate degrees. Yeah. But I look back on that sometimes. I think, I don't know, maybe I would have been happier. I would have, I might've been more financially successful because uh, I'm still paying for that law school degree. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so it's, it, it's something we should all think about, but you know, we've got this, this cultural mindset of like, well, if you're good, it's, if you're, if you're the best, you got to go to college. If you're, if you're good, you have to go to college. And, and then our second step is like, okay, we're, you're, you're on the conveyor belt, which all high school kids are, and you're going to go to college. And if you don't go to college, well, then we'll give you this universal basic income. You know, like, <laughs> right. All right. You're too dumb. Okay. Here's your money. You know, just go away and leave me alone. You know, instead of mm-hmm. saying like, Hey, look, what are you into? How about mechanics? You know, I mean, how about robot, you know, the, the next generation of who's going to fix the, the AI machine, you know, those are, those are going to be tech degrees. They're not going to be, you know, four year degrees in, in uh, critical race theory, you know, it's going to be yeah. like w- learning to the the technical uh, ins and outs of these particular machines. And, and, you know, there's not going to be truck drivers in 30 years. Well, but there's going to be machines that need to be fixed. So these are, these are all, you know, options and kid and what Cass is trying to argue is rather than saying, okay, you're out of high school, you didn't make it in college because you know, you had, you, you took a few classes 
then you had to drop out, you know, and, and it was, it was really tough. And okay, now what are you going to do with your life? You know, okay, work at McDonald's. You know, he's saying like, get started right uh, early, like they do in Europe and say, all right, Hey, look, college is an option if you want it, but it looks like to me that you might be interested in some other stuff. Do you want to try this, you know, this vocational program where you can start working right away and we're not just doing third degree black belt algebra instead, you know, you can focus on your, on your job and you can make a little bit of money that way. You're not going to maybe not going to drop out either because you're, Mm -hmm. you're making money too early and you know, you can find something that you're actually interested in. He makes a point also like that it, it would be crazy if college was right for everybody. You know, I mean, colleges were developed and they are still based on the system that was for the uh, well-rounded education of rich young men. You know, yeah. that's what college was in the 19th century. You know, if you went to college, it wasn't even to get a job, you know, yeah, was, right. <laughs> you were going to, you, you were already in that class of, uh, rich fellows who even if your if your dad didn't own the company he knew somebody who did you know you were it, it wasn't about that so i mean skills training which is why a lot of us go to college now i mean people why go to college get a good job okay but that doesn't have to happen in a college you know mm-hmm. yeah. and we're, we're kind of shoehorning middle class striving into an upper class uh institution and it's a bad fit you know yeah for the same reason that a lot of the academic track high schools are a bad fit, you know, they're, they're teaching you a bunch of stuff that, you know, if, if you want to, if you're going to end up in a career that involves you know, thinking and writing and, you know, esoteric subjects, they're good, the good things to know. I'm glad I took philosophy courses. It's, it's helped on in this podcast Yeah, <laughs> and it's helped, it's helped in things I write too, but that didn't really help me get a job in the same way that, you know, some sort of certificate saying I have mastered these skills would help. Yeah. Yeah. And to put a cherry on top of it, you know, in, in my own career now, like I work with a lot of companies and without question, these are the jobs that they're the most concerned about because there are just massive shortages of all of these trades, all of these voca- all these career paths that are vocational, that are, you know, trades, there's tons of shortages. And it's, it's one of the main reasons that the companies are so, you know, sometimes focused on getting high skilled immigration or mid skilled immigrant immigrants to come because right now we do, we just don't have enough Americans who are in a place that either want to do it or can do it. And so I, I think Cass is really onto something because it's not like you're going to be an apprentice electrician and then not have a job where a lot yeah. of this, this is happening a lot with college graduates, but it's not going to happen to you if you, if you study, go through an apprenticeship to be an electrician, there's just tons of jobs, too, too many that they're just not being filled. So, all right. So he, he also talks in depth about immigration and globalization. And, uh, this is a subject we've touched on in, in prior podcasts for immigration. You know, this is almost like the two sides of a coin. Like when it comes to the right and left folks on the right are maybe more focused on how immigration, ch- you know, changes or l- lowers wages and changes culture where folks on the left are more concerned about how trade outsources jobs. But what Cass is going to say is they both basically do the same thing. So for, Mm -hmm. for lower skilled workers, he calls uh, immigrants imported substitutes, especially when produced by American firms that have moved operations overseas. So you have, it's kind of like the, the folks on the right, the populists on the right are concerned about immigration because of the way that it, lowers wages and also changes culture. But, they are, but they're also deeply concerned about international trade. And I think this is where folks, uh, the populist right has a, a sour attitude about, about corporations, American corporations. It's not so much the income inequality. It's not the CEO pay ratio that the left is so obsessed with. Instead, it's, it's almost like disloyalty, you know, because mm-hmm. you're an American company. And instead of employing American workers, you're going to move overseas and employ uh, a Chinese or a Vietnamese worker or a Mexican worker instead and, uh, and give those jobs and that money to someone else. Is that how you see it? Yeah. I mean, and I, I think that's a, I don't think that's a hundred percent wrong. I think it's mostly right. Problem is, I mean, he talks a lot about the, the trade-offs of all of our uh, labor laws and environmental laws. And there's a big section on environmentalism. I don't think we're going to have time for today, but mm-hmm. we pass all these laws and a lot of our 
corporate leaders are all for them. You know, I mean, we've got a lot of woke corporations nowadays that are all for whatever the left is pushing. But those things are the things that make it too expensive to produce here. So we've got a political class that's pushing things with the idea that there are no trade-offs. You know, yeah. that's that's something we've been coming back to since we read uh, Thomas Sowell's book you know, back in episode uh, uh, 23, I think. Everything has a trade-off. There's no economic move. There's no political policy that's not going to have a trade-off. And yet we, we pass all these things like, well, don't you love the environment? Sure. Okay. Don't you love workplace safety? Yeah, I do. I mean, I don't want guys getting mangled by machines, collapsing in mines, you know? All right. So all these things add to costs. And then the same guys who are pushing them, the same class of folks who are saying, yeah, we need all these things. And they're saying, well, now, you know, we can't really produce here. It's, you know, we'll send that job to China where they don't have any of that stuff. <laughs> you know? Yeah, so it's, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I can see why people are frustrated about it. I yeah. mean, to call a corporation an American corporation these days is not always, I mean, I don't know. It's, I mean, Ford is an American corporation, I guess. They're from Detroit, but they make stuff all over the world. They sell stuff all over the world. Mm -hmm. Their executives aren't necessarily all from here. So, so when and, we had the Buchanan episode, I, I, I pushed back on this a little bit and I, mm -hmm. I think that there's, yeah, there's, there, there's something to it there. I mean, I, I think that we also have to you know keep in mind that a lot of these companies are producing for those foreign markets too. You yeah, know, I mean, it's true. Uh, GM has a huge plant in China, but those cars are basically all sold in China. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. and the, you know, we want our companies to succeed by selling to a much wider market because then that, you know, that money does come back to America. But, but I mean, he, he's, he's putting his finger on something that I think is a real concern. And again, it's not the, it's not the income inequality aspect of it. It's, it's kind of like the, Hey, what about us? You know, the, the kind of disloyalty almost. So that, I think that's, that's the trade part and the immigration part. You know, he'll, he says more immigrants mean lower wages for everybody in blue collar industries. And I mean, I think this is the most basic economics. I mean, it's like econ 101, mm -hmm. but um, folks on the left just ref refuse to agree with that. And, uh, yeah. And that, that quote you just read with this, that was, this one shocked me because that was from the Washington post talking about all of uh, the illegal Mexican immigrants returning to Mexico you know, do the stepped up enforcement and they wrote more returnees means lower wages for everyone in blue collar industry, such as construction and automobile manufacturing Where competition <laughs> for jobs is likely to increase economists say in Mexico, in Mexico, they say that about Mexico. Like it's obviously true because it is, but <laughs> they don't take the next step. They're like, wait a minute. What about when all those folks were here? What did that do to our uh, blue collar industry, such as construction and automobile manufacturing? You know what? If you won the job in a slaughterhouse or in farm labor, the, the influx of unskilled labor definitely affected your wages. And he talks about, you know, after some deportations, wages on farms and in construction jumped 10% to 15% in just four years. And starting wages for new hires rose by 40 to 60%. And that that's sort of the other half. You know, you hear people say, well, we can't get people to do these jobs. It's like, well, if it's unskilled jobs, then there are people out there who have the ability to do it. You're not paying enough. And that's, you know, that's, again, the same market forces that benefited those employers when there was loads of unskilled labor, you know, when the labor market tightens and, and you know, as Cass says, it is a market, even if it's a different kind of market, yeah, you, you're just going to have to pay more, but people will work. Just that one just took me aback that, that quote in the Washington Post, like, wow, they, they know this works. They understand the economics. They just won't apply it to us ever. Well, yeah, they will willfully, willfully ignore the, yeah, that. Yeah, it's crazy. The application here. It's not that he hates, uh, you know, immigration in general. It's just that he says the issue is whether we are admitting the appropriate mix of immigrants, how different things might look had we welcomed highly skilled immigrants, but more tightly restricted the entry of less skilled, which is what they do in Canada and Australia, he says. And I'm actually pretty familiar with this too. In Canada and Australia, they're much more picky. You know, they're, they're going to take high skilled immigrants. It's very, very easy to immigrate to Canada or Australia if you're a high skilled immigrant. And it's very, very difficult, if not, you know, almost impossible. Because here in America, we, most of our immigration is based on family, is family based. So you're going to come here based on a family relationship where in Canada and Australia, 
they'll let you in based on a skill. And so what Cass, Cass is saying is that's, we should, we should change our policy to uh, better align with, you know, what Canada and Australia are doing. Let's take the high skilled immigrants, the people who are going to come up with the innovation and the new ideas and you know, build the new companies. Mm-hmm. And then for less skilled workers, let's limit that so that, you know, wages go up, you know, to your point. Yeah. This is one, this is one time when people on the right are going to be able to say, Hey, look at Canada. Yeah. They're doing it right. <laughs> yeah. We could be like them. Even and those hippies in Canada. Do it like yeah. <laughs> and, and it's true. And Canada is a good example. This isn't, I mean, they're, they're a lot like us. You know, Australia is too. They're both nations with similar histories and structures to ours. So seeing it work there, which it does, and Canada has a lot of immigrants. And, you know, it's and Australia does too. It's not like the, they've they've thrown up a a wall to keep everybody out. They they allow a ton of immigration. It's just they actually think, well, how can we organize this in a way that benefits this country? Mm-hmm. Right. And that's something America really doesn't do. Right, right, all right. What's your closing thoughts? Well, I, I would say, I mean, there's a lot in this book that we didn't even get to. There's yeah, a lot there of policy is. prescriptions. Um, and I think a lot of our uh, struggle with some of the right wing, I don't want to say statism, but more involved state ideas that we've come across, you know, whether it be Sora, uh, Amari or, or some of the others, is that, you know, at the end of the episode, we're always like, all right, now what? You know, yeah. what do you want? What do you want to do? I mean, it's it's one thing to say, oh, liberalism has failed. OK, but. What, what should we do to fix it? And this Orin cast gives us a lot of ideas and I don't, I don't know that all of them are right, but I think a lot of them had me nodding my head. Uh, and it's definitely well-researched. It's good food for thought. I, I think if you want to know where we go from here, if you think the welfare state has, has failed, but pure libertarianism is not the answer. There's a lot of, there's a lot of good suggestions in this book. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree with all that. And, and it's too bad that we you know, don't have enough time to get a lot of it. I mean, we did talk about ed- educational tracking. That's one of the main policy prescriptions. We talked about limiting our, um, you know, immigration and shifting the ratio of, you know, who, what, what types come. He, he would also argue that when it comes to trade, what we need is some targeted tariffs, uh, use targeted tariffs to bolster us workers. He says, which sounds a whole lot like DJT. Yeah, there's some of that. (laughs) Yeah. And then he says, uh, well, there's one where he says, provide a subsidy for low wage work, which is kind of like the earned income tax credit funded with higher tax rates and reduced transfer payments. So instead of, instead of transfer payments where, you know, folks are, you know, just getting money for SSI or something like that, let's shift that for, to encourage people to work. You know, Paul Ryan, when he was speaker had, had ideas along these lines, maybe not as you know, forward leaning, let's say is, is Orrin Cass. But yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed this book because he's, he's really coming at it from a perspective that's neglected. And that is, I think there's a real difference between the populist left and the populist right. And we hear all about the populist left because income inequality is the uh, preoccupation of the elite coastal media. And as a result, you know, that's what we hear about. But in fact, folks on the right are populists and but they they're taking a very different tack, and and I think Warren Cass really does a great job of of explaining that, and laying it out, and then pointing to what kind of policy prescriptions you know he would go for. That uh, you know, like you said, may or may not you know work in some instances, but I certainly think the educational tracking is a is a great idea. All right, that's it for Cass. Next time we're gonna have a great book. We're still uh, in flux of of what we're actually gonna read, so. It'll be a mystery and exciting and surprise. (laughs) So catch us then. Thanks.